I want you to turn, uh, if you have a Bible, you can look at the screen. Um, I'm going to read two passages of Scripture as I begin this message today. This is a thought I've been meditating on for a couple of weeks, and um, I've shared uh, this past Sunday as well, and uh, a little different version this morning, but um, I want to talk about the curse today. In fact, I've entitled my thoughts today, Reverse the Curse. Reverse the curse. Let's look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> to Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. <clears throat> it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. I knew vegetarianism was a curse, but anyway, there it is right there, <clears throat> right there. Mark chapter 15, verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, hail, king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe <clears throat> and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you for the power of the cross and for what you did for us 2,000 years ago in your son. I pray you'd help me now to communicate this morning in these brief moments. Anoint this chapel with your presence as you already are doing. And help me, Lord, to encourage every person in this room that we can live under the blessings of God because of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, a little different kind of thought this morning to talk about the curse uh, on Easter week. But I think you'll understand as we continue through these thoughts why we're doing this today. It is Wednesday of Passion Week. Jesus will soon go to Calvary and give his life. Uh, this word curse in the Hebrew uh, comes from several different Hebrew words uh, that are translated to us in English as curse or cursed or cursed. Um, it means set apart for punishment or misery. <clears throat> the absence of God's blessing. To pronounce negatively against someone or to pronounce punishment upon them. In the Greek, the word curse comes from a word which means imprecation, execration, or an angry denouncement <clears throat> or a spoken curse against someone. <clears throat> In short, curse is the removal or absence of blessing. But what causes people to be under a curse? What is it that seems like some people are under a negative spiritual energy and are under disfavor their entire life? Why is it that sometimes it feels like our lives are cursed? Where does that come from? Well, first of all, it comes from original sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, the world came under a curse, the disfavor of God. It, it's amazing that the ground was cursed because Adam sinned against God. And so God says the ground's gonna be cursed and as you toil in the ground, it'll bring forth thorns and thistles. In other words, the world will move toward disorder and not order. If left alone, things move toward disorder and chaos. In the garden, that was not true. Things were in great order and remained in order at all times, but sin brought disorder. It brought failure, it brought corruption to the earth and ultimately brought a curse symbolized by the ground bringing forth thorns and thistles. So original sin, uh, the pronouncement of others at times can bring people under what feels like a curse, negative announcements against someone. There may be some of you in the room this morning that were told at a young age, you're dumb. And you were told over and over again, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb. And you got to believing it and it created a negative energy around you. So when you sit down to do your studies, there's this uh, recording going off in your brain, you're dumb, you're dumb, you can't do this. 
Today I want to tell you that's a lie and it's broken through Jesus Christ. But there may be other pronouncements against you of all kinds and all sorts by others. Sometimes you may be under a curse because of generational sin. The Bible tells us that the sins of the fathers are visited and mothers are visited on the third and fourth generation. So you may be down line two or three generations and still feeling the effect of your parents, grandparents, or even great grandparents' sin. Your great grandparents may have plunged your entire family into poverty. And now you reap the results of that and it feels like you're cursed in poverty because of your grandparents or your great grandparents' sin. Or your mom or dad may have been an alcoholic and you feel this tendency toward alcoholism because of this dynamic released in your family. And some people call these generational curses. Demonic influence, of course, can bring a curse upon us. Most of us in this room have never had a, a doll made to look like us and stuck pins in it uh, to, to bring disease and, and death to us. But that happens around the world. And for our students in Africa and other parts of the world, they know this is a real thing. Witchcraft is real and does have a, a real sense of power. It's not as great as God's power, but there is power in such things or most likely, most likely, people suffer under a curse because of personal disobedience, personal disobedience. Disobedience has the power to bring us under disfavor with God and bring us to where it feels like we are under a curse. So God gives this graphic illustration before his people go into the land of Canaan. And he tells Moses, when you get into the land of promise, I want you to take some time with the people of Israel and help them understand the blessing of obedience and the cursing of disobedience. In fact, do so by a graphic uh, illustration of two mountains. Gather the people in the valley between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And on Mount Gerizim have the priests and the leaders pronounce the blessings of God. And on Mount Ebal have them pronounce the curses of God. And the people will be in this valley of decision and must decide, do they want blessing or do they want cursing in their life? And if they want blessing, it only comes by obedience. And so in Deuteronomy 28, he outlines how we are blessed when we're obedient to God. He says, when you are obedient to the law of God, you will be blessed geographically. You're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field. In other words, when you're obedient to God, it doesn't matter where you go, you are blessed. They can put you on a plane and send you to Bofu Thotswana or wherever that's at or Timbuktu. And when you get there, you will still be the blessed of God. I learned this when I was about 24 and went on my first overseas missions trip. I landed in Indonesia wondering if I would be a different man when I got there. It was on the other side of the world. I'd heard of what all God did when you went on mission. And so I get off the airplane and the first night I'm there, I think, well, Doggone it, I'm still just Billy Wilson. Not Superman, not super missionary. I'm just Billy. Same problems I had when I left Cleveland, Tennessee and got on the airplane I still have in the middle of nowhere, Indonesia. And the same anointing I had when I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, I have in the middle of nowhere, Indonesia as well. I found out that geography does not stop, hinder, or alter the blessings of God. You're blessed in the city or you're blessed in the field. God promises if we obey him, our family will be blessed. He says, the fruit of your body will be blessed. God will bless your children, your marriage, and your family if you obey him. God promises if we obey him, we'll be blessed financially. If we treat our finances the way God orders for us to, if we tithe, if we give, if we're generous, if we obey the Holy Spirit, we will be blessed. He says it this way in Deuteronomy 28, your livestock will be blessed, your food, your lambs, uh, your wealth, it'll all be blessed. When you are obedient to God, God will bless your resource. Somebody say amen. amen. You'll be blessed positionally. You'll be blessed when you go in. You'll be blessed when you go out. 
You'll be blessed when you enter a job and you'll be blessed when you leave the job. You, God, uh, the jobs and positions don't stop, hinder, or alter the blessings of God. I've been appointed, uh, unappointed, disappointed, reappointed. I've been elected, unelected. I've been through all of that and I want to tell you none of that stops the blessing of God. God blesses you wherever you're at if you're obedient. Amen. You'll be blessed in battle. I like this one. Uh, God says, if you're obedient to me, your enemy will come one way and he'll run before you seven ways. You're going to have some battles, but you'll be blessed in the battle. You'll be blessed with an open heaven. God says, when you pray, the heavens will open up. Rain will come down. It, when you pray, it will feel like you've got a direct connection with God when you're obedient. You'll be blessed to lend and not to borrow. In fact, God says to Israel in Deuteronomy 28, if you obey me, you will be a lending nation and not a borrowing nation. Now that alone tells you a lot about the condition of the United States of America. Our debt load is trillions of dollars. It tells you right there, we're not being very obedient to God. When you're obedient to God, he blesses you so much you lend and don't borrow. God's gonna bless you guys. If you're obedient to him, he's gonna help you with your debt. He'll help you get through it. He'll help you get out of it. And before you know it, you'll be lending and not borrowing. Come on, give God praise. Amen. I've seen it work. You'll be blessed in your leadership. God says, if you're obedient, you'll be the head and not the tail. But then he says, and this one is a lot longer in Deuteronomy 28, these particular statements. He says, if you're disobedient and you refuse to obey my law, then you will be cursed. Mount Ebal then will be represent the curses of God. You'll be cursed geographically. You can't get away from it. You can go here, you can go there, you can go in the city, you can go in the field. You can go to New York City or you can go to Homer, Alaska, you're still gonna be under a curse. I meet people at the ends of the earth places sometimes like Key West and Homer, Alaska. They've ran as far as they can run from God and they're still running even though they're as far as they can go. You can't get away from it. When you're disobedient to God, you're gonna have his disfavor, you're gonna be under a curse, you can't get away from it. You'll be cursed in your family. This is very difficult in Deuteronomy 28, but God says if you don't obey me, your children are gonna be cursed. Wow. He says you'll be cursed financially, you'll be cursed positionally, you'll be cursed with a brazen heaven. If you don't obey God, and don't obey his law, when you start to pray, it'll feel like the heavens are sealed up and your prayers bounce back to you, they go nowhere. You'll be cursed with habitual sickness and disease. He adds this one in Deuteronomy 28. You'll be cursed before your enemies. You'll come against them one way and you'll run seven ways. You'll be continually defeated over and over and over again if you're not obedient to God. You'll be cursed by debt and you will be cursed in your leadership. You'll be the tail and not the head. The curses of disobedience are severe. Everyone say amen. So the people of God stood between these two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, deciding, do we want to be blessed? Absolutely. But the requirement is that we obey God's law fully. Now the difficulty was, of course, that God designed it that no one could keep his law completely. So they have this desire to be blessed. They have this desire to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, their children, their family, their finances to be blessed. And yet no one could keep the law of God themselves. And so they find themselves in a continual struggle with disobedience. That's why there had to be another mountain. It was called Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary. At Mount Calvary at Golgotha, at the place of the hill, the place of the skull, where Jesus was crucified, blessing and curse came together. Law and grace met in the body of Jesus Christ so Jesus could break the power of the curse for us and we could live in obedience to the living God. Listen to this description in Galatians chapter three, verse 10 through 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. It is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Listen, listen. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, 
Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. For years, I preached this mess, this, this scripture and studied this scripture and never took time to look up what it meant was cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. But in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22 and 23, it says this, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. A hanged man is cursed by God. As the Jews saw Jesus hanging on the cross, they thought to themselves, he must be cursed to die such a death. And as they saw him at the praetorium and they put a crown of thorns, man, that's sticky, Eric, on top of his head and drove it into his scalp by hitting him multiple times. Uh, Everyone around thought he is cursed. Uh, These are crowns from the ground that was cursed in Genesis uh, when Adam and Eve sinned. And he's wearing a crown that represents the curse. And I say exactly, exactly. He He took the symbol of the curse upon himself. He became king of the curse to be lord over the curse and to break the power of the curse in his death and by the shedding of his blood once and for all. He hung on a tree as a man that would be cursed so he could be a curse for us and he could take the negative energy of the curse in his own body and break its power so you and I in Jesus can live blessed for the rest of our life. Come on, give God praise. Woo, amen. He became a curse so we might have the blessing of Abraham upon our life. Now, what is the blessing of Abraham? The blessing of Abraham is stated in Genesis 12. I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you, the Lord said. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. This is our promise in Christ Jesus. Let me say to you, when you are blessed by God, every curse is conquered. Every curse, every curse is broken at the cross. Hallelujah. When you are in Christ, curse is broken. Now Jesus came also to the Mount of Beatitudes to give us a redefinition of his requirements of our living and then died on Mount Calvary in order to give us the power to do what he commanded us to do in in Matthew 5 on, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. The truth is the blessings of God come on our life because of Christ's obedience and our obedience. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and our abiding in him, we now become recipients of the blessing and we live on Mount Gerizim more than on Mount Ebal and we are blessed everywhere in every way and the blessing, the favor, the goodness, the grace, the love, the generosity of heaven is on our lives because we are in Christ Jesus. He took the cross upon him so you and I have the blessing of Abraham in our life. And part of that blessing is whoever curses you is cursed. Ouch. Ouch. In fact, let me say to this, when you're blessed, you can't be cursed. When you're the blessed of God, when you're living under God's blessing and living in Christ and living in obedience, you can't be cursed. People will try to curse you. They'll try to offset you. They'll try to put you down and God will just raise you up. It'll be like Joseph. They'll, they'll lie on you. They'll throw you in prison. They'll forget about you and God will use it all and turn it around and lift you up, lift you up, lift you up and make you a person of importance even though they cursed you. Hallelujah. I don't think we understand this power that when we're in Christ, we, be, we, we enter the non-cursed zone. We become blessed of God and live in the blessings of God as long as we're obedient to him and we cannot be cursed. There's an Old Testament story, an account in Numbers 23, 24, 25 
about uh, the people of Israel, the children of Israel were journeying from Egypt on their way to the land of Canaan. They'd been in the wilderness for a number of years. The older generation had died and a new generation had come on and they were now about to march into Canaan. They were going up the east side of the Jordan River. The land of the Amorites had fallen to them. Kings had fallen to them. They were conquering kingdoms. They were becoming a people of war again. And uh, there were about 2 million of them. In fact, it says 600,000 men. So women and children, probably over 2 million, marching together through uh, this area on the east side of the Jordan River, about to enter uh, across the Jordan River and conquer Jericho. But on their way, they went then through the land of Moab. Moab was on that side of the river uh, because of Lot's disobedience and uh, his children, uh, his disobedience. The Moabites rose as a kingdom. When Israel got there, the king of Moab was very worried. His name was Balak, and he thought, well, if I don't do something about this two million people coming through here, they're gonna tear Moab down, and they're gonna conquer us. And he said, I can't defeat them with my own army. So he said, I'll try something spiritual. So he sent to the north, and he found a diviner, a prophet, as it were, but more of a secular kind of prophet named Balaam. And he sent money and said, Balaam, if you'll come and put a curse on God's people, on on Israel, on this two million people that are coming through the wilderness, he said, I'll uh, I'll pay you whatever it takes. Balaam uh, sought the Lord about it or went to sleep on it. And God spoke to him in the night and said, you can't curse these people, they're blessed. So he came back the next morning and says, I can't go with you. Uh, God says he's blessed these people and doesn't curse them. So they went back, they told King Balak, we went up, we we offered the money, he wouldn't have it. So Balak said, well, okay, let me send my most important people. So they sent the most important entourage, the influencers of the kingdom of Moab. And they went and said, now Balak is serious. He'll pay you whatever you want, Balaam, if you'll just come curse these people. Balaam said, well, let me sleep on it again. You just guys just hang out. That night the Lord told him, said, uh, well, yes, I only will bless them, but go ahead and go with them. So the next morning he gets on his donkey and he starts uh, from the northern area of probably around Syria all the way to Moab. Some of you know this account that the donkey um, sees an angel. And when he sees the angel, the donkey turns and goes out into the field and Balaam gets upset with his donkey, gets off, he takes a a stick and beats the donkey, gets back on the donkey, rides it a little further. Next place, the donkey sees that he's between two walls and sees an angel right in the middle resisting uh, their advance toward Moab. And and the donkey gets over toward one of the walls and scrapes Balaam's leg against the wall. And he gets mad again. He gets another stick and beats the donkey again, pulling his ears. I could just see him right now, you stubborn, stupid donkey. Next time the angel positions himself in a way that the donkey can't go to the right or the left and there's just no wiggle room and so the donkey just lays down the third time. Balaam gets off the donkey, grabs his ears, grabs a stick, starts beating the donkey and the donkey says, hey, why are you beating me? Now, there are a lot of political jokes in here but I'm not gonna get into any of them, but the donkey did talk, okay? I'm not gonna get into those. The donkey talked. And so the donkey said, hey, I've never done you wrong. All these years you've ridden me and I've never hurt you, right? And and Balaam said, that's right, but said, you're driving me crazy. You go out in a field, you rub my leg against the wall, now you just lay down, you stubborn, stupid donkey. And then Balaam's eyes are supernaturally open and he sees the angel. And God says to Balaam, if your donkey had not turned out of the way and went up against the wall and laid down, I would have killed you. Sometimes things are happening in our life we don't understand and we need to trust God that he's got us. You ought to clap right there, that was really good. So Balaam says to the angel, okay, I won't go, I won't go to Moab. He said, no, no, go on. 
Just tell, just do what God says to do and say only what God says for you to say. Okay, he goes, he finds Balak. Balak says, I'm glad you got here. Balak takes him out, he shows him this vast group of people. He says, come on, curse them. So they kill a bunch of animals. They do like seven sacrifices. One of the ways divination happened is they would kill an animal and then they would try to read how the animal's body, um, the internal organs laid out on the ground. So they had all these organs laying out and Balaam is trying to discern what's being said by that and then he says uh, he says this in his first attempt to curse them he said how can I curse those whom God has not cursed how can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced may my final end be like theirs these people are blessed well, Balak says come on man I'm paying you whatever you want I sent my most important people for you come on curse them so he takes him to another place, shows him another part of the camp. He can't see all of it. It's two million people. He shows him part of them. And Balaam kills the animals again. He starts to curse again. And just as he starts to curse them, he says this, the Lord their God is with them. The shout of the king is among them. Hallelujah. And he can't curse them. So Balak says, okay, maybe he's had a bad day. Maybe he's cross-eyed. Maybe he's tired. He's sleepy from the trip. Let's go to another place. He goes to the third place. He, he looks over the people of Israel. He says, come on, Balaam, curse them for me so I can defeat them. Balaam opens his mouth and he starts to curse them. But instead of cursing them, he blesses them and says, the Lord, their God is with them. Uh, like a lion, they crouch and lie down like a lioness who dares to rouse them. May those who bless you be blessed and those who curse you be cursed. The blessing of Abraham is on them and they cannot be cursed. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Huh? Now, what does that mean to us? It means this. It means when you are blessed of God, you will not be cursed. You may not get the, uh, the, the promotion that you think because God may have some better promotion than mine. Somebody at work may be against you. They may uh, be difficult on you. They may be pressing on you. They may be pushing you. You think, man, it feels like I'm under a curse. No, no. If you're the blessed of God, God will turn it around. Listen to what is said in the book of, uh, of uh, Nehemiah 13, verse two. Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, talking about the Moabites, hired Balaam to call a curse down on them, and parentheses. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. And that is what will happen to you every single time as they try to curse you, as they try to put you down, as they try to speak evil against you, God will turn it around and reverse the curse because Jesus broke its power. Wow. Psalm 109, 28, while they curse, may you bless. May those who attack me be put to shame. May your servant rejoice. Proverbs 3, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Proverbs 26 and two, I love this one. You have as little to fear from an undeserved curse as from the dart of a wren or the swoop of a swallow. Like a little bird flying by, the curse will not harm you. It will not hurt you. It will not tear you asunder. And then Jesus says it this way, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat treat you, they are going to need it. Why? Because when you're in the blessings of Abraham, whoever curses you comes under a curse. You understand? You're, it's like Holy Spirit Teflon. And when the curse comes against you and hits you, it just reverberates off of you and comes right back on them. So be confident in the Lord. Pray for those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Ask God to help them, to bless them, to touch them because their curses are not gonna hurt you. They're not gonna put you down. The curse has been broken. It's been reversed in Christ. And you have become the blessed of the Lord and will be blessed. Wow. Jesus wears the curse to the cross as far as we know. The crown of thorns was driven into his scalp and stuck there. And hanging on a tree, carrying the symbol of the curse on his head, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords broke the curse so that in him, we are blessed. The thief on the cross discovered that at the end of a wretched, cursed, absent from God life, come on out, Kimmy. That when you acknowledge Jesus, when you cease your objections of him, 
when you give him everything, he turns your curse to blessing. And in five seconds, the one thief confessed Jesus as Lord and says, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus turned a cursed life Dying because of murder and sedition, been on the wrong side of the tracks and the wrong side of life his whole life. His family, his future, his destiny all seemed totally ruined. But when he looked to the king of the curse, it was reversed. And he was blessed to enter paradise. And his life has become a great testimony for the gospel. In your seat today, you have the elements of communion. The elements of communion. <clears throat> I didn't realize we were gonna do the video today. I'd heard it was with another song. When I didn't see that song on the list, I didn't think we were doing the video, so good job. But as we watched uh, the video of the Passion of the Christ, we're reminded that the cross was ugly. It was brutal. No wonder they said whoever is hanged on a tree is cursed. Men shouted curses against Jesus. It looked like all was lost, but in that moment, God was reversing the curse and breaking its power over our life. So that by the shedding of Christ's blood, a new people would be born. A people that would have the blessing of Abraham and live in obedience and dwell at Mount Gerizim and not Mount Ebal. Before that moment, before bearing the curse, Jesus called his disciples together the night before and while they were eating, Matthew 26, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. You may take the element. And as you take the bread this morning, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus' body was broken so that you could be made whole. And that he became cursed so you could be blessed. Take the element, you may eat the bread. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Then he took the cup and we had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You may take the cup and drink this juice representing the blood of Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Jesus said, I won't drink the fruit of the vine again until we do it together. In heaven, there will be no curse. Revelation 22 and three says, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Everyone stand if you would. Bow your head. Bow your head. Lord, this morning, some people in this room, Lord, they feel that there's a negative cloud hanging over their life. Whether it's a pronouncement of someone against them, whether it's a generational thing, whether it's just been their own disobedience. I pray, Lord, in this moment, as we have partaken of communion, that the curse would be broken. 
You tell us, Lord, that we are not responsible for our parents' sin, but we answer to you alone. And so, Lord, in you, we have a new DNA, a new spiritual DNA that breaks the power of sin. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that I am a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things become new. And Lord, as we've partaken of this representation of your body and of your blood, we're reminded, Lord, that you were broken, made a curse for us so that the blessings of God might come on us every day of our life. Kimmy, let's sing something. Let's all sing this together. Let's take a few moments. Let's just worship together. of you. I am blessed. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. My family is blessed. My finances are blessed. My leadership is blessed. My, I'm blessed in battle. I will come out victorious. No curse against me will prosper. Hallelujah. I am blessed. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you guys. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college, but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our Quest Leadership events. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered experience at ORU. Visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. Want to advance your career but can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. 
you can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu.